Welcome to another Astro 310 video. Today's video will be talking about space system design. Uh, we have two objectives. The first is to identify the five elements common to all space missions and to understand their interrelated nature in space system design and operations. And second, we're going to, I'm going to give you the tools that you need to be able to develop a mission needs statement, goals and objectives, a list of stakeholders, and a concept of operations for a given mission. So jumping right in, how do we go to space? In previous lessons, we've talked about why we might want to go to space, but how do we actually get there? Well, the space mission architecture identifies five key elements that are going to be a part of any space mission. The first is the mission itself. Second, we're going to talk about a spacecraft. Third, we're going to identify an orbit and a trajectory. Um, fourth, we're going to talk about our launch vehicle. And lastly, we're going to talk about our mission operations. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail on each of these elements in the, in the subsequent slides. The first is our mission. So this part of our uh, space system is really talking about our purpose. So this, who needs what? Why are we actually doing what we're doing? What is it that we're trying to address? What key need, what key capability are we hoping to deliver? We've also got goals and objectives that are gonna be identified in this element. What do we wanna accomplish? How well do we wanna accomplish that? We're also gonna talk about stakeholders, those who have a vested interest in the outcome of our space mission. We're gonna identify users. We're also gonna identify sponsors. Um, lastly, we've got this idea of a concept of operations, which is really of how we, do we actually, or how are we planning to accomplish this mission? What are we trying to do and how is that actually going to uh, work itself out in, in the details? Next, we have our spacecraft, which is another key element of our space system design. Um, our spacecraft really has components that can be divided up into one of two categories. Components can be either categorized as payload components or bus components. Payload components are those that are key and are essential to performing the mission. Um, bus components are those that are in, really in support of the payload components themselves. So, for example, we have a generic communication satellite over here depicted. Um, and as a communication satellite, its goal might be to communicate either with the ground or other spacecraft. Um, and so those antennas might be a key component um, of, of the payload of actually performing that communications mission. Then we can identify other components of the spacecraft, such as the solar panels, which are essential for the antennas to do what they need to do, but they're not necessarily um, uh, classified as payload components. In this case, these, these uh, components would be identified as bus components. Third element is that of an orbit or a trajectory. Uh, so an orbit is really the path a spacecraft follows through space. Uh, when we talk about orbits or trajectories, really we're talking about um, two different distinct uh, paths. There's the launch path, which is really from the Earth to the orbital altitude, and then we actually have the orbit itself or the um, path a spacecraft follows around the Earth. Fourth, we can identify a launch vehicle. So all space missions are going to incorporate some sort of launch vehicle. It's really a rocket that's going to propel our spacecraft into space and then also maneuver them to the mission orbit. And lastly, we have our mission operations category. And this element, this is really the glue that's holding the whole mission together. Um, it's the infrastructure that we need to get uh, the mission from ground to space, which can include manufacturing facilities and launch sites. We also have an infrastructure that we need to maintain our mission once our satellite's actually up in orbit, and that includes communication networks and our mission op centers. So um, all five of these mission architecture elements are really essential to accomplish the mission, and people are the key ingredient into making this into a cohesive mission. Um, people are going to use system engineering processes. Uh, those are essentially designing and building systems that deliver capabilities to meet user needs. And they're also going to use project management, which is managing people, processes, and resources uh, to deliver the mission on time and on budget. So as you're developing your own mission statement, you might consider uh, these three questions. So the first might be, what does your space mission, um, what is it really trying to accomplish? Which kind of gets into that goals and objectives aspect of what we were talking about earlier in terms of the mission. What do we want to accomplish and how well? You might also think about the question of how does your space mission accomplish its goal? How does it do what it needs to do? And that really kind of digs into that idea of the concept of operations. How do we plan to accomplish a mission? And lastly, why does your space mission do what it does? Um, so this is really addressing kind of the need. Uh, who needs what? And the stakeholders are really that who, uh, being the users, the sponsors. 
who wants this to succeed? Who needs this to succeed? Who needs the product or the capability that your space mission will uh, deliver? So I hope you've learned a couple things about um, what a space mission architecture is, and then also that you have some tools put together so that you can develop a mission needs statement um, and some of those other uh, concepts that we're going to ask you to uh, deliver later on. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Um, really, a day does not go by where we're not touched in our modern society by space. And so that's one of the really cool things about um, the stuff that you're going to be learning is that it's going to, uh, you're going to see ramifications of that in your everyday life in ways that you may not even um, have thought of before. So pretty cool stuff. So Major, I'm Major Grant Thomas. I'm one of your co-course directors. And so I'm going to be leading through you guys through this lesson now. So hopefully, great. So we basically have two objectives with this lesson. The first is to kind of talk about why space. And the second is to understand what are the four most common space missions. So we're going to talk about why space to kind of begin with here. And to start out with, we've got this term called astronautics. So what does astronautics mean? Well, there's really two pieces to it. There's the astro and there's the nautics. So astro is talking about space. Nautics is really talking about sailing through. So it really means sailing through space. Let's talk about space to begin with. What do we mean when we are talking about space? Well, to begin with, you might look here, and this is a picture of the Earth, right? Looking down at the North Pole, and you've got this kind of blue hazy stuff over here. This is our this is our atmosphere. Sorry, we're going forward now. <laughs> there you go. So this is our atmosphere. So when we start looking up from the surface of the Earth, we the first thing we encounter is our atmosphere. But once we get beyond Earth's atmosphere, which is kind of like if you can think of a, the Earth being like a peach, it's kind of like the fuzz on the peach is like our atmosphere. Once you get beyond that fuzz, you get to what we're going to call low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit is also known as LEO, is the area just beyond Earth's atmosphere. So this is where the majority of our um, remote sensing kind of satellites are going to be. So satellites that are taking pictures of the Earth. If you need to get up close and personal, so the things that you see similar to kind of like the pictures you would see on, on Google Earth, a lot of those are taken actually from aircraft, but we'll kind of imagine that that you know pictures like that, uh, satellites that do that are often in LEO orbit. And that's because the closer you get to the surface of the Earth, the easier it is to take really sharp and crystal images, crystal clear. Uh, but just beyond LEO orbit, orbit or low Earth orbit is what we call medium Earth orbit. So some people might think this is middle Earth orbit, but that's like Frodo and the rings and all and all that stuff. So that's a little different. So medium Earth orbit is MEO, which is where all our, geo, our, our GPS satellites are actually at, is, is at MEO. And then we get to the special orbital regime called GEO, which is geosynchronous orbit, which is a really useful orbit for us because it turns out when we put a satellite out here at this ring, it's going to basically move around the Earth at the same rate that the Earth is spinning. So from the Earth's perspective, it's going to look like the satellite is, is fixed, or at least it's not moving terribly much in, in space. And so that allows our ground um, you know, contact kind of problem to be much easier because we can reach out and touch that satellite much, much easier because it's basically always in our field of view. So those are three orbital regimes. There's actually one more that I'll talk about here briefly, and that is what we call HEO, which is usually referred to as our highly elliptical orbits. So those highly elliptical orbits look like this ellipse here. And we'll talk more about what these things are, but I just wanted to kind of introduce these terms to you right now because you're going to see them later throughout the course. In fact, you might even see them in the news at times where they start talking about things being in low Earth orbit or in geo. But basically, each of these orbital regimes are going to have some utility for us that we're going to exploit and they have some unique advantages. All right, so that's kind of what space is. Um, how many things do we have up there? And so here's this is a picture and this is kind of a it's a cartoon of sorts. So all of these satellites are, are not to scale, but the numbers of satellites are to scale. So if you look at these numbers of satellites here, what you can see is we have approximately uh, 5000 satellites up there. But the satellites themselves aren't the only things that we care about. We actually care about all of the pieces of orbital debris. And what you'll see down here, it says that there's approximately 23,000 pieces that are greater than, greater than 10 centimeters. So 10 centimeters, if you take your hands and kind of put them together, you know, if you take both of your palms, it's kind of the width of both of your palms. So a piece that's greater than that 
um, is is basically we've got 23,000 of those that are orbiting the this around the Earth. And like Colonel Sauter mentioned, these things in low Earth orbit are going Mach 25, which I like to think they're going about seven kilometers per second, which is a bullet fired from a rifle is about a kilometer per second. So seven times faster than a bullet is how fast these things are actually cruising around. So if you can imagine something the size of like a small watermelon, that could absolutely devastate your satellite or your rocket or anything else that's going through space. So these things are definitely objects that we want to avoid because they could be catastrophic if we were to hit them. Um, and then we have, you know, approximately 500,000 pieces between one centimeter and 10 centimeters in diameter. So that's quite a few pieces, right, that are that are absolutely damaging, right? So even one centimeter um, could could absolutely devastate your satellite if it's going seven kilometers per second. So that's something that we're going to have to avoid. Um, here's another illustration of that same picture. Um, and again, this is not necessarily to scale. All those white dots are probably, well, they're bigger than what you would see for an actual satellite. Um, but the numbers of dots are are real. And so you can see the cl the majority of our satellites are kind of right around here, around the surface of the Earth. So right around LEO. And then you've got this other, this is the geo ring out here. So you can actually see that, this is pretty cool. All right, so let's get some scale. Let's talk a little bit more about scale. How big is space? Well, you can see from this picture, if you kind of see it in the upper, kind of cruising across the top there, that's the moon going around the Earth. And it takes approximately two and a half seconds for light traveling at the speed of light, you know, so very fast. I think it's three times 10 to the eighth uh, kilometers, meters per second, rather. So very fast. Um, it takes about two and a half seconds for light to go across the uh, basically the diameter of the moon's orbit relative to the Earth. So if we look at our solar system, it takes approximately eight and a half hours for light to go across our solar system. So the majority of space is actually just empty space. When you see these pictures of like, you know, our solar system, you think, you know, like at least when I was in grade school, you had, you know, the sun and then there's Jupiter and Mars and all these planets out there. Those are actually very minuscule. They occupy a, a minuscule amount of volume compared to just the sheer vastness of space. So face it, space is just immensely huge. So eight and a half hours, if you can imagine that, takes light to go from one side of our solar system to the other. Next, we can look at, because our solar system is part of a larger galaxy, right? And so it takes approximately 100,000 years to go across just our galaxy, right? So we're here, right? So this is us in this one little teeny piece of the Milky Way galaxy. So 200 to 400 billion stars. So here's another cool little video. There's no sound for this one, but um, it's a kind of a zoom in of a portion of space. So you, this is like what you might see when you look up in the night sky. And we're zooming in here on one part of space. So Hubble actually took this long exposure in a very small section of space. And with this long exposure, they're actually able to see all these different galaxies. How small is this little uh, picture that we're looking at? Well, if you can imagine standing on one side of a football field and somebody put a tennis ball on the other side of the football field, kind of the angle subtended by that little tennis ball is about what you're looking at here. So in that tiny little tennis ball fraction of the sky, you have all of these different galaxies. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So that's kind of just some mind blowing facts about how vast space is. For the majority of this class, we're actually going to be concerned primarily with the space directly around Earth. Um, but not to understate it, space is incredible and there's really no way to fully grasp how truly vast it is. And that's one of the really interesting things I think about about the subject in general. All right. So why do we go to space as a military? Well, there's basically five advantages that we're going to talk to you uh, about, and the first one is that of global perspective. So when you're in space, you actually have a clear view 
of the battlefield. So if you want to think of, you know, knights of old, right, they would actually go on top of their castle and they would climb up the tops of the ramparts and they would look. And the reason for that is because they have a lot better situational awareness of what's going on and what's happening on the battlefield. Space is kind of the ultimate high ground. So higher than being in a plane, I can not only see what's happening in a local area like the, the you know, cadet uh, like, uh, like Yusafa, I can actually go up and see what's happening in an entire city or potentially in, an entire state or even an entire nation, right? So for weather patterns and whatnot, it's really useful for me to not just look at, at Colorado, but to be able to see the weather patterns in, that are, you know, the actual clouds and things that are turning and moving uh, up on the West Coast and things, um, because I'm able to better predict what that's going to be. So that's part of our global perspective. So basically, I have the ultimate high ground. The next is a clear view of the heavens. So not only can I look down at the Earth from space, but I can actually, by being in space, I'm outside of Earth's atmosphere. So all that scintillation that you see at night when you look up at the stars and they're twinkling uh, wreaks havoc on our optics. And so it's very nice for us to be actually able to be above the Earth's atmosphere so we can see out to deeper parts of space. That's how we're able to resolve that imagery like Hubble's, the Hubble Deep Space uh, you know, uh, images that we get. So clear view of the heavens is our second one. The next is a free fall environment. So what you'll learn from uh, from the next few lessons is that when you're in orbit, you're actually in free fall. So when you're in free fall, that's actually very advantageous for us because it enables us to basically develop materials that we can't really make here on Earth. So we're, we can be in free fall around the Earth, right? So we can like go in a, I don't know if you guys have heard of the vomit uh, comet, but basically it's a plane that goes up and basically does these parabolic trajectories and you can end up with a little bit of free fall on the order of seconds of free fall, you know, 60, 90 seconds, something like that, I think at the most uh, of free fall. Um, being in orbit allows us to be in sustained free fall and we can basically form different materials there, uh, which can be helpful for us in terms of medicine and even some advanced manufacturings. All right, so the next one, this one's kind of coming into vogue with the uh, new exploration of the moon. I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with any of the new stuff surrounding the Artemis Accords or any of that stuff, but basically space is a land or an area of abundant resources. So as much as there's a vast emptiness there, there's also these really cool rocks and even potentially uh, precious metals. They think that the moon Actually, they found that the moon actually has quite a bit of aluminum in the soil and things like that and regolith. So they're able to actually potentially exploit that, not to mention the fact that we have lots of solar energy up there. So there's all kinds of new um, technologies that they're proposing to basically beam power down to Earth uh, from outside of, uh, you know, essentially the surface of the Earth. So that would be really interesting if that actually came to bear. Um, but basically, there's these abundant resources there. Next, our next, uh, you know, key reason that or you know key advantage of being in space is that of the final frontier so this is you know if you think of um part of the reason that you know mallory talked about what was it the mountain we talked about everest you know why climb this big mountain because it's there right space is the ultimate final frontier it's the ultimate uh unknown and so we learn a lot about ourselves we learn a lot about our current environment the further we extend ourselves into these unknown places and so that's part of what we're going to do by going to space so those are the five advantages that you'll need to know for this lesson um we'll talk a little bit more about the sailing part sailing through space when we talk about satellites so satellites in general are the man-made objects that we have um, that go around the earth that do things for us so we've talked about what advantages we gain from space, but how do we actually use space? How do we exploit those advantages? And basically, there's at least four missions that we're going to ask you to be responsible for. And those missions are communications, remote sensing, navigation, and science and exploration. And so briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what each of these missions are and why they're important. You're going to learn a lot more about these missions specifically as we go on. But fundamentally, communications is a huge one. 
So we have all sorts of satellite communications going on. And when you think SATCOM, you, you might think like me, you know, voice, essentially, you know, making a phone call, a cell phone call, something like that using space. And absolutely, that's that's a part of what we do. Um, but one thing that you may not think about when we think about comm is that we use the internet itself. So all of our feeds from, for, in, for example, all of the predators or the global hawks or any of the UAVs, they're going to utilize SATCOM to actually get their video uh, from the AOR, so from the from the region where they're actually uh, flying, back to the operators um, who might be in Las Vegas or someplace like that. So, internet, TV, video, voice, all of those things are use use communication. They're absolutely critical for all of our military forces to be able to. So, for for Marines or Army troops or Navy ships at sea to be able to communicate with their um, respective entities and their command and control units. That's absolutely critical for military presence. There's also, also a significant amount of, of commercial SATCOM going on as well. Think DirecTV and whatnot, so, or Sirius XM radio, stuff like that. Those are all comm satellites and they use um, SATCOM technology to, to accomplish that. So that's one of the primary things that we do in space. The next is remote sensing. And when I say remote sensing, you can think, OK, that sounds like sensing remotely. So you're sensing from afar. You're basically taking pictures, taking images and exploiting those images later in a military construct construct. You're usually using those images for intelligence purposes. But um, for you know civil purposes, you might be doing weather. And so this is a really important, uh, useful thing for people you, who might not even you think be uh, users of space. Farmers are absolutely dependent on this uh, information so that they can plan their their crops and when and when and where they should plant and things like that. So remote sensing is absolutely critical for them um, in terms of how they're able to do what they do. Farmers also use the next piece, which is navigation, and that is lots of our uh, technology. Uh, today, modern in the modern world, use GPS, um, which is basically a position navigation and timing. So that timing piece is absolutely critical for all of our ATM transactions, the stock market, for traffic lights, for the power grid. So it takes a, a an order from the president himself to shut down GPS for even an hour, uh, which they would never do. It's basically a, a treasured national resource. Everyone uses it now, not just the military, but absolutely we're dependent on it. So navigation is another thing that we use um, satellites and use space for. Lastly, you can think of like NASA type missions. We do science and exploration. So we go to space to explore, to see what's there. Um, we're even going beyond our solar system with satellites like Voyager. So I'm not gonna dwell on that too much, but suffice it to say, you've got these common space missions and all of these are going to be uh, fleshed out in more detail, but these are some of the ways that we actually use space and accomplish our needs. So I think we've got, that's it. For the lesson, we're not actually going to take a break until 9 10. That was from before. But at this point, that's the end of the intro to space lesson. Um, and if you're looking for uh, the notes for this lesson, you can find those in the OneNote. Um, and of course, you can go back and watch this video. Eventually, it will be posted if you want to go back and review it. Um, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Major uh, Cameron Cunningham, who's going to lead you through your next topic. Hey everybody. So. Hi. Uh, I'm Major Cameron Cunningham. And uh, I'm going to be leading you through this, the Space Force Weapon Systems lesson. Um, so let me just want to introduce myself real quick. Um, uh, I am originally from Denver, uh, Academy grad in uh, the great year of 2008, um, majored in space operations, and I'm, I'm what's currently called a 13S in the Air Force, which is a space operator. Um, but that is soon hopefully transitioning over to the Space Force, which uh, President Trump signed into law last December. Um, so now it is the sixth uh, military service or armed service. So uh, I'm excited to hopefully join that uh, come September. I'll, I'll find out in July if I made it. But really good to be here with you guys. Um, I'm also our, our operations director for the FalconSat program. So if you hear about, um, you know, some of your classmates being in FalconSat, um, that's me um, along with them. So um, without any more ado, let's go ahead and jump in to this lesson. So the YouTube video for this lesson addresses something really important and addresses basically how we kind of think about acquiring and putting together space systems in a really general sense. Um, it, it doesn't cover the actual Space Force weapon system. That's what I'm here to cover with. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides now. Let me give this a shot here. 
And hopefully you guys are able to see this. All right. So first of all, I just I want to hang out on this first slide because this is the Space Force seal. So you guys have been immersed in seeing Air Force content uh, your whole cadet lives, which is awesome. Um, you're going to see a whole lot more Space Force content. Um, logos, patches, people wearing that uniform, hopefully me, we'll see. But the point is that's the official approved logo uh, of, the, of the Space Force. You can see the, the Latin you know, down there at the bottom, the MMXIX of 2019, right? It was established. So um, we're a department, oops, that we, the Space Force is a department under the Air Force in the same way that the Marine Corps and the US Navy are under Secretary of the Navy. Um, the Air Force and the Space Force are under the Secretary of the Air Force. So, um, we have a chief of staff who is sits alongside General Goldfein. His name is General Raymond. So um, on equal footing now with the Air Force. This is really cool. Alrighty, guys. So the, the objectives such as they are, are I want you to know the current Space Force systems. There's a couple more objectives that have been added since I, I made these slides. Really what I want you to be able to do is I'm going to throw an acronym soup at you, basically. Uh, all of these um, satellites have abbreviated names, which is to say like, so for example, space-based uh, space surveillance will be SBSS. There's S's and A's and all kinds of just letters flying around. So what I recommend is just knowing what those satellites are, doing a little study and associating. Um, we're not going to ask you to write out, hey, for SBSS, what are all the, um, wh what do each of those letters stand for? What we are going to ask you is this. I made this slide specifically. We'll make sure this is available for you guys. Um, the slides that you have access to have an extra column in there, but uh, you don't need to pay attention to that so much. Uh, on the left side, I have the names of satellite weapon systems uh, and over on the right side there if there's an astro 310 what we call the common space missions that major thomas just went over um it's listed there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you through how the space force looks at its own weapon systems and on each of the slides that i have i'm going to make sure that you guys know i'm going to be very clear um, what kind of astro 310 mission is associated with so that's what we're going to be doing here and then i'm also for your just for your knowledge, I'm going to expose you to some additional weapon systems. However, comma, um, they may not be testable. So um, we don't foot stomp uh, in this course, but I would really want you to emphasize this slide that I'm currently on right now. Slide three is, is the one to study. Um, the rest of my slides are essentially uh, visual aid for me. So, okay, let's begin. So ooh, uh, joint doctrine, right? Um, the reason I put this slide up is because this is currently how the joint warfighter, so Army Bubba's, Navy folks, um, our sister services look at us and look at themselves when they think of space. Um, again, this, this is not testable. This is the slide that I want you to focus on, but I'm exposing you to this for the sake of knowing that you've heard some of these things by the time you get out to be a second lieutenant in the Air Force or Space Force. Okay, first mission we're gonna talk about is space domain awareness. Um, and it essentially is trying to keep track of all those objects that Major Thomas mentioned in space. There's a whole lot of active satellites that uh, are actually doing things we need them to do, right? Our satellites, enemy satellites, allied satellites, but there's exponentially, well, maybe not exponentially, but a whole lot more junk that is not doing what anyone wants it to do. No one cares about it, as in no one's actively uh, communicating with it and it just stays up there in orbit for tens of thousands of years so the objective of keeping track of where both junk and friends and enemies and neutral parties are in space is what space domain awareness is it's keeping track of all the things in orbit that's a really big mission um so let's talk about the different systems that i have on the slide here spss it stands for space space uh, space surveillance and that is a low earth orbiting satellite that looks out into geo into that so basically it, it orbits close to the earth and it looks out far away from the earth to try and gauge what's going on and where are again friends the neutral folks and the bad guys out in geo um gsap uh i'm going to mess up this acronym but essentially it's doing the same job as sbss but out at geostationary so it is basically trying to keep track of geostationary satellites because that's, as, as you guys are going to hear over and over in this course, that's a re really populated, 
populated orbit. And the reason is it's very useful. So friends want to use that orbit. We want to use that orbit. Allies in neutral parties and bad guys. Want to use it. OK, so these systems accomplish space domain awareness. Geodes is obviously not a satellite. This is actually a set of telescope stations across the world um, that just are literally electro optical, a telescope, just like you might buy online, but very, very powerful versions of that that look up into space. And they're doing the same thing. They're trying to track objects in space. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is the space domain awareness mission. Uh, all of these do, in the Astro 310 sense, what we would call remote sensing. So SBSS does remote sensing, GSAP does remote sensing, and GEODS is a remote sensing platform, even though it's not a sound. This is the one that perhaps, and I hope that you guys have, uh, without knowing it, you've all used this in the past. Colonel Sauter, when he did his introduction, uh, gave a huge uh, plug for uh, the position, navigation, and timing mission, uh, which Astro 310 just calls navigation. But GPS is the primary platform that does this. Um, we started launching GPS satellites or their ancestors in the in the 70s. Um, used to be called Navstar, but now uh, we have a constellation of GPS satellites in in MEO, uh, medium Earth orbit. The entire world relies on that. Um, so basically, not all these satellites basically broadcast where they are in, in a timestamp, a very precise timestamp. And you have a receiver on your phone or on your Garmin, if anyone still uses those, um, that takes a bunch of information from different GPS satellites, calculates the math, and basically gives you a very precise position of where you are on the Earth. Um, as Colonel Sauter was talking about with, with an ATM, it's not using the navigation part of GPS, it's using the precise timing of GPS, right? So that timestamp that comes from the satellites is extremely precise compared to like um, a wristwatch or anything like that. So we use that very precise timestamp to give the banks information so that um, you're not withdrawing more than you should, etc. cetera. Um, ATMs and our financial systems all run on a GPS timing. So that can be a big vulnerability, but it's also a modern miracle, GPS. So the, the primary constellation that does navigation GPS. I, I could spend an entire class on this slide, uh, and I do. Uh, I teach our SATCOM class uh, here at the Academy, but thankfully you guys don't have to through that. Uh, what I really want you guys to know is essentially sat satellite communication satellites, SATCOM birds as we say, are like giant cell towers in the sky. So they're taking your signal and rerouting it to somebody else. So you can see uh, this fella, this army, he's an army guy, an army radio operator fella that has a small um, SATCOM station set up and evidently there's a C-130 taking off in the background for dramatic effects. But um, that, as Major Thomas said, all our RPAs or UAVs rather fly over SATCOM link. So the operators will be sitting in a trailer somewhere here in CONUS in the US. Uh, and yet through a SATCOM link, they are operating an RPA weapon system that is on the other side of the planet, um, providing maybe kinetic effects, right? Killing terrorists or actually providing video. Um, and we rely on that intelligence. So the SATCOM link is is a weak, it can be a weak link if you haven't protected it. But what I really want you to know is that Milstar and AHF um, provide basically nuclear comms. So that's that's SATCOM. Discus and WGS provide SATCOM and UFO and MUOS. So all these satellite constellations we've listed here are, are the DOD military space force systems that relay communications. Um, we also buy a lot of commu uh, commercial uh, satellite communications from other providers, but what are you going to be tested on? You're going to be tested on what, what does Milstar and AEHF do? Well, their communication satellites, etc. Discus, WGS, UFO, and UF. Perhaps more than any of the others, this is an alphabet soup, so really recommend getting familiar with these. But these are the, these are the platforms that do communications, in my opinion. Um, tracking weather. So DMSP is one of the oldest Space Force missions that we have had. Um, it used to be that the DMSP satellite, um, Defense Meteorological Support Program, uh, would fly around uh, the Earth in a very low orbit looking for bad weather. And the original intent of the program was to make sure that the weather was clear so that the Corona satellite that I just talked about could take a picture. Um, and the reason that was important was Corona used actual film, physical film, nothing digital, and it would drop buckets of film. So it was really important not to waste any because you couldn't just fly up and refuel or uh, Corona or give it more film or anything like that. So uh, we've obviously repurposed DMSP, you know, just to, to track weather. And actually, if you have the right UHF receiver, anybody 
can can downlink DMSP uh, weather images. So kind of neat. But um, what I want you guys to know is our joint warfighters actually really depend on uh, updated weather. And there's there's uh, the equivalent of there's basically special warfare operators in the Air Force who are uh, trained to go in with spec ops teams and basically track the weather so that um, their clement conditions to either go take out bin Laden or, or whatever, whatever raid. But there's folks and you can you can identify them. They have gray berets, uh, but they're Air Force folks that uh, rely on this weather um, in spec ops teams in particular. Uh, when I was deployed, we had daily weather briefings also because in Iraq and Syria, um, if it had rained, it made a lot of the desert impassable because uh, they turned into, I forget what the Arabic word was, but basically rivers showed up out of nowhere. Um, because there's water in the desert that was never meant that water. So anyway, weather is really important for our, both for civilians, but really, really important for DOD. So uh, DMSP and GOES are the satellites that provide weather. Um, and that still falls under the category of remote sensing because they're really, they're sensing um, our atmosphere from orbit. All right, here's another uh, very important remote sensing mission, missile warning. Uh, so in the 60s, um, every American uh, child was trained to duck and cover under a desk uh, because of the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent China. Uh, but mostly the Soviet Union, we were locked in, obviously you guys know, called the Cold War, um, basically an arms race um, and an ideological race around the planet uh, to try and, and keep nations free and protect ourselves from communism and from the Soviet Union. So. Um, we built a satellite system in secret called DSP, um, which is the one that kind of looks like a Coke can with a straw coming out in the bottom right there. It is supposed to, it is supposed to and does look for very hot signatures on the surface of the planet. Uh, and that would correspond at, at the time we thought with an ICBM launch and, and it very much did. And not only that, DMSP was able to see, or uh, DSP, I'm sorry, was able to see even smaller rocket launches. Um, like scuds coming from Iraq in, in Desert Storm. So um, it's a uh, child, basically, the, the newer satellite version of it is called Sibbers, which is the other satellite picture there. But both of those look for very, very hot um, signatures on the Earth's surface. They're looking for infrared signatures, um, which correspond to rocket launches. So um, there's also a non-satellite thing that's pictured here, right? In the bottom left, I put um, what's called um, upgraded early warning radar, the UEWR, and that's obviously a giant building. It's about four stories tall. It's tilted at however many degrees there, but it's looking up over the or up onto the horizon to from a ground-based perspective to see over the horizon if there's a missile launch coming. So around CONUS, um, we have these UEWR radars, these massive radars basically looking for uh, if, if an ICBM were to pop up above the horizon, one of these radars would be one of the first to know. Uh, and so between those satellites I just described and the UEWR, they're, they're doing a remote sensing mission called missile warning, basically giving us, giving us early enough warning of a nuclear attack such that we could respond in kind. Okay, the last thing, I, I, well, almost last thing I want to talk about is a, a network of antennas across the entire world. We call this the Air Force Satellite Control Network. It'll probably be renamed in the future, but right now we, we call it the AFSCN um, because it used to be under the Air Force. Basically, there's tracking stations, as we call them, across the entire world that will allow us to talk to satellites basically any time of day if, if we can see them. Um, we have uh, all the way from Thule, Greenland, um, all the way south into the, the British Indian Ocean um, in Diego Garcia. Basically, everywhere we have a distant either allied or American post, we've got one of these AFSCN sites. Um, England, Greenland, um, Diego Garcia, Guam, Hawaii, right? Um, and basically, they're just they're SATCOM antennas that, that relay commands to our satellites and then receive information back down from them. And all OK, so um, as a quick kind of aside, as my question slide, I'm going to leave this, this up here. Um, I just wanted to kind of chat about Space Force. Um, if you guys have been hearing a lot about it, I mean, there was a lot of interest, obviously, in it um, in back in December. And then January and February, COVID was happening, and everyone is obviously now at home. But not to worry, Space Force is still here. Um, and we commissioned 83 lieutenants um, from the class of 2020 into the Space Force. And so you guys, as you approach 
you know, your AFSC selection and your base drops, um, we'll be given the option to request a Space Force Commission. So um, you can basically, it's sort of like pilots in the Air Force. They'll be, you know, pilots are our operators of weapon systems in the Air Force. Um, and don't forget our cyber folks too. But pilots and then a, a bunch of support functions that are super important, like engineers, like acquirers, like Intel, like cyber. Space Force will have all of its own versions of those. We'll have our own cyber, our own Intel, our own engineers, our own acquirers. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to, first of all, pay very close attention to NASA 310 because this class will set you very far ahead of your peers who haven't been exposed to space. But also come and talk to one of us because uh, I can give you a whole lot more information in person uh, than I can over a, a huge Teams uh, call. That concludes all the content that I have. Again, please come to talk to one of us if you're interested in Space Force or um, yeah, doing any of those functions in Space Force.